Good evening. My name is Rachel Moore, and I am a senior political economy major here at Hillsdale College. Tonight, I have the great pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Larry P. Arn. Dr. Arn is the 12th president of Hillsdale College, where he is also a professor of politics and history. He received his bachelor's degree from Arkansas State University and his master's and PhD in government from the Claremont Graduate School. He also studied at Worcester College, Oxford University, where he served as director of research for Sir Martin Gilbert, the official biographer of Winston Churchill. From 1985 to 2000, he served as president of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. He serves on several boards of directors, and he previously served on the U.S. Army War College Board of Visitors for two years, for which he earned the Department of the Army's Outstanding Civilian Service Medal. In 2015, he received the Bradley Prize from the Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation. He is the author of three books, Liberty and Learning, The Evolution of American Education, The Founder's Key, The Divine and Natural Connection Between the Declaration and the Constitution and What We Risk by Losing It, and most recently, Churchill's Trial, Winston Churchill and the Salvation of Free Government. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Larry Arne. Thank you, Rachel, who's a marvel, isn't she? Yeah, <laughs> they tend to be. Um, okay, I'm gonna talk the right amount of time. Now I have a reminder. So uh, I'm sorry I'm not Ed, well, I'm not sorry I'm not Ed Rollins, but I'm sorry he's not here. <laughs> um, we still don't know uh, what happened to him, uh, but we know he was hospitalized, and we think he's okay, but we don't have definite information about that, so remember him in your prayers. I uh, know him a little. Uh, I've met him several times, but uh, one time, and Lord, I can't remember when it was, it's so long ago, I was in meetings with him for a few hours about a failed political campaign for a Senate, for the U.S. Senate, and not mine, in uh, California, and you missed a treat because, uh, you know, he was Reagan's, one of Reagan's key political guides. And so I'd always imagined somebody like Reagan, I guess. What he is, is he's quick as a cat, and he's a wild storyteller, and mostly not off color. And, uh, and uh, so you're missing a treat not having him, but I'll do my best. Uh, I'm proud to be here. I'm proud to talk to the students at the college all the time. They're my favorite thing. My colleagues, the faculty and staff, are, a lot of them here, thank you for coming. And thank you, visitors. You're always welcome here. Uh, somebody said to me today, uh, well, you operate at a very elevated level here at Hillsdale College, and that's true, but I also want you to know that uh, when they get here when they're 18 years old, they're very young, and so don't ever feel that you're not able to learn just like they are. You have the advantage of age on them, at least. So I have four points. Um, I think the Republican Party today faces a crisis, and it's like the crisis that it was born to face. Uh, I will say I don't say so far it does so well as the original one, but the original one didn't at the beginning either. I'm gonna say a little bit about what that crisis was then and what's like it today. Uh, I guess those are my first and second points. I'm gonna say what I think the Republican Party is trying to do about it today and uh, what I think it should do. Um, those are different things, alas, but um, there you go. Um, have you noticed that politics are always in a crisis? It's the nature of the beast, right? In Hillsdale, Michigan, we have crises all the time. You know, shall we increase the income tax? Shall we discipline the cable provider? You know, it's always a crisis. But sometimes there are real ones. And uh, how would you know when they're real ones? I think they're real ones when they affect the fundamental things that make the country what it is. And I think those are knowable. Uh, I think they're knowable about anything, by the way, about any human thing, for sure. Uh, things have their definition from the purposes they serve, and they have their definition from the way they go about serving them. In classical thought, that would be the final and the formal cause. And it's not hard in America to say what those two causes are. The final cause is stated in the Declaration of Independence. 
in the laws of nature and nature's God and things that you know about human beings because of them. What you know about human beings is they are equal, equal in their humanity, equal in their right to consent to the government over them. The same kind of thing is what it means. And in America, we have on three occasions had big disputes about those two things. One of them was in the revolution, one of them was in the Civil War, and I think one of them is today. Uh, you heard Charles today, an old friend of mine, Charles Kessler, who's a very wise man. And so you have some preparation for understanding what the Republican Party had to face at the beginning. It was a crisis about the final cause of the land. Uh, in the founding, among the leading founders, it is simply never to be found that they thought that human slavery was right under the terms of the Declaration of Independence. They agonized about it. Also, they reduced its scope. Uh, by about 60% in the th generation that followed the Declaration of Independence. And they thought that was right. In uh, 1787, we uh, laid down the way that the country would grow in the Northwest Ordinance. And it would grow by, not by colonies, first time this had ever happened, but by the admission of equal states full of equal citizens. And in that ordinance, there aren't many, very many things that happen in that ordinance. And turned out, if you look at any old law in American history, you will find that it is brief, which is unknown today. <laughs> but one of the things, it sets up the system of education, which makes a talk unto itself, and it's a very different purpose than we serve today with education in most places. But uh, they provide that there's to be no slavery in this new first territory, which includes Michigan and Ohio, and three other states, uh, there's to be no slavery in those places ever. And that was on the motion of Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, and the land was ceded to the Union by Virginia, a slave state. And that happened relatively without controversy. And then exactly 33 years, one generation later, the Missouri Compromise was passed, and that was to admit Missouri, but now it was very controversial whether the number of slave and the number of free states would be equal in the United States Senate, and that meant that there was a force that had ar has arisen, a great political force, that slavery is a good thing and it should be extended. Those are two grand documents in the history of America, and they say opposite things about that question. They both speak of the time and what people thought at that time. And for some reason, people had begun to think, many people, not all, turned out not a majority, but that was hard to say at any given point, thought that slavery was good. That's articulated best in the writings of John Calhoun, who you can read in our Constitution Reader, as well for that matter as the Northwest Ordinance. And what he said was, they're different and not equal because of race. In other words, the essential thing about them is not that they can talk and they walk upright and they have a conscience. The essential thing about them is their color, which is a token of their race. And their race, of course, that's a historical subject. Uh, uh, race unfolds over time. Uh, it's passed down from generation to generation. And he said that these had, through a process of history, he did not, so far as I can remember, use the expression evolution, but others did, Alexander Stevens, the Vice President of the Confederacy did. They had evolved to a lower place, and it would be an abomination. It would be a betrayal of the race. It would be a betrayal of the upward direction of human history if we, did, if we had blacks and whites living together as equal in their political rights. They're not the same kind of thing was his argument. And, and uh, you know, John Calhoun studied at Yale, and he studied with a student of Friedrich Hegel, one of the prime authors of the historicism that afflicts America today. And this change, this debate now, argument, which led to the most costly war in American history, that also immediately did what such causes always do when they operate, and that is they started putting pressure on the form of the government. And there were enormous changes recommended in how that would be. The, the, the pace of the crisis was much governed 
by the presence of the Western lands. Uh, one of the greatest movements in human history is the movement of the American people across the United States. It's hardly anything to think of like that. And uh, I rode a motorcycle with some buddies of mine and my son across the country. And you learn it really is a whacking big old country. <laughs> and when they start out, set out to settle it and make it the empire of liberty, as George Washington liked to say, they didn't really know how big it was. And, and while they were doing that, because 1820 is when, is, is a, because that's when the Missouri Compromise was, that's when the pressure arose because now we've got to decide, are we going to have slavery in those places or not? And those places, until they're formed as states, are governed directly by the federal government. And so slavery requires a big system of laws. Uh, go in the Constitution Reader of Hillsdale College. And I, I'll add a point when I mention that. You know, Hillsdale College is a very different place than most academic institutions for reasons I'm going to state in a minute. But I want you to know that it is an academic place. And that means that we study things and learn things by arguing about them. And we try to read everything relevant. So our Constitution Reader, like our history readers, both of them, like the things we re read in literature, uh, often disagree with each other. Indeed, in the Constitution Reader, most of the readings are written by people who don't much like the Constitution of the United States, which is sort of how the political controversies in the, in the nation's history have gone, especially in recent decades. So you can read the Al Alabama Slave Code in there. It's in there. And you know, it's not limited government because there's detailed regulations about where and for how long and under what circumstances black people can assemble or leave the plantation, but there are also lots of regulations about whites, about who you can have in your house. Uh, free white males were required to ride, to ride posse once a month looking for runaways, whether they were slaveholders or not. And you know the inconvenient thing about slavery, especially if you think it's a really good thing and good for the slaves is, they had this terrible habit of trying to get away. <laughs> you didn't see so commonly the masters running to get away from the slaves. It was the slaves trying to get away. So are you going to have laws that protect it? And if you are, then you're going to have a different kind of federal law. And that's going to prepare the way for a union, because more states would come in with slavery in them, and that would constitute what Lincoln called a peculiar interest. And so that's a, a fight about the form of the government, not just whether it will protect slavery, but also how intrusive it will be on people. And so those two things confronted the Republican Party in the beginning, and just like the founding of the country and the success of the revolution and the extension of the country across the uh, land, you wouldn't bet on their success when you looked at them starting, looked hopeless. And it nearly was. And it turned out different. Well, I think this problem today is like that problem in those two respects. Um, it's the reason I think it's a crisis. That word crisis means turning point. Remember Lincoln said famously, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Well, this is a divided house now. We've got more than one way of thinking about government and more than one way very heavily entrenched in government. And that starts with some claims about the final cause of the government. And I think that those claims that are made today in, in, in the American Academy, above all, from which this problem stems and where it gets its chief energy today, are like the claims that were made in the Confederacy. Except they're not understanding themselves to be on the right, trying to preserve an old order, uh, one of the things that happened in the Confederacy is they rewrote history an awful lot. We all do that, according to the political passions of the day. We try not to do that at Hillsdale College. That's why it's hard to be an academic. But they did that quite a bit, and they said they told a new story about America. And the story was the Declaration of Independence was never meant to be very important, and this principle of equality is not what the country was all about. It was all about something else. It was about us ruling our local societies however we might please. And so today, what is the story? The story today is not on the right trying to preserve an old order, but it's kind of like it in other respects because what it does is it substitutes for this idea of nature. 
the idea of history or change, like that idea in John Calhoun's account of the inferiority of the blacks. What does it mean? First of all, what does nature mean? Nature comes from a Latin word that means to grow. And you know, you plant an, you plant an acorn, and unless you intervene with modern science, which you can do, you're gonna get an oak tree out of that thing. What it's trying to do is become an oak tree. And uh, once you see that it starts with that Latin word for birth, and it means the beginning and growth that produces a living thing, then it also comes to mean what the thing is when it's fully grown, its essence, its meaning. The oak tree is superior to the acorn because it's what the acorn is trying to produce. Uh, and it can't mean what it's like when it dec decays, living things all decay. And so it's not just old, it's not just age. In fact, at the end of the age, they're less like themselves. In fact, at the end, living things turn into dust. All of them do. It's like what it's like when it reaches its excellence. So the nature is the essence of a thing. And so when we say we have our rights in nature, it means we have them from what we are. Look at us, you can see. How do we act? What are we like? We're human, right? In some ways, that's a kind of pitiful thing to be. Compare it to, imagine, to, to what you imagine an angel to be. But if you're like me and my wife, you take enormous pleasure from the cavorting of dogs, and we have the worst dogs in Hillsdale County. <laughs> and the thing is, they just always act like dogs. It's just the coolest thing you ever saw. But they're dogs, you know? And uh, one time I said uh, to Penny, because they stare at you, you know, and they, and Penny thinks they're trying to put telepathic signals into her mind. <laughs> and I said, I think that he's quivering on the threshold of understanding. And Penny said, Penny replied, Betty doesn't cross it. <laughs> History is something different. What if you think, a plausible thing to think, and this is the argument, that all of us would think radically differently in this room if we had grown up in Rome or in Sparta versus Athens, two things that lived at the same time. Culture matters so much, doesn't it? That word culture is also cognate with a word that means to grow. So maybe we're not really just a nature blessed with understanding and capable of reading a book and see what it means no matter when that book was written. Maybe what we are is a product of our experiences. And it does seem that the experiences are very powerful, aren't they? And in historicism, what we think is they're all powerful. We even think, writes John Dewey, and, and remember, all of this is related to the thought, for example, of Karl Marx, who was a kind of a popularizer of Hegel, and he turned it into a political agenda. You can estimate what's going on in the economy and you can see how the revolution's gonna go. Well, if we're all products of our history, that's kind of despairing. Isn't it? Because it means that this argument that I'm making, and whatever you make of this argument, this argument is just produced by the circumstances, my circumstances, and the circumstances of the people who taught me. We don't have any independence from the facts we confront in life. Frank Goodnow, one of the main progressive thinkers in American history, is in our Constitution Reader, of course, and he says in there, we teachers take ourselves too seriously because our students are ultimately just going to think whatever the economic conditions of the day tell them to think. That's kind of sad, isn't it? That might be part of the reason why in the school today, what we tell kids today is that the truth is what you think it is, and your job is to just figure out whatever you think it is. We don't cozy them along quite like that here at Hillsdale College. They do say, you know, natively, because they grow up in this world, they'll say, if you ask them a hard question, they'll often say, according to whom? They don't say the worst thing yet. You just want my opinion about that. They know better than that. But they'll say, whose answer do you want? And we try to, you know, I'm fond of Aristotle, so they always try to, they, they look up Aristotle's answer and try to tell me what that is. And I always say, well, I'm not asking about that. Nor did Aristotle, I'm wondering what the dang thing is. What is that thing? If you have a human nature, and if the classical and faithful religious account, Christian account of it is true, you can do that. But if the history account is true, you can't. And that takes the wind out of a lot of sails and also destroys the principle of human freedom. So what can relieve that terrible despair? Well, 
There's an opportunity latent in that if you, once you accept it. It turns out that science, that, that, that's an old Latin word that means to know, natural science meant knowing about natural things, things that just grow of their own or are of their own, not by human making. Uh, now that word science comes to mean a kind of making. You can study a thing and take it apart and you can figure out how to change it. And in that case then, maybe you could remake the whole society because if people are produced by these circumstances that unfold, then you could produce the people however you please. I'm reading four totalitarian books in a class with my students this term and they're just delightful and of course frightening. 1984 and Dr. Darkness at Noon and three other things like that. But what do they say, these torturers and imprisoners and leaders of the revolution? They say, we can make you into whatever we want you to be. When they mean it kindly, they mean we can perfect the society. In 1984, they don't mean it kindly. O'Brien says to Winston Smith, I can only be sure that you're obeying me when you're in pain. The rest of the time you might just be doing what you want and we can't have that. Doesn't necessarily have to be kindly because by the way, what would be the dignity of kindness is against unkindness according to these principles? Well, the American progressives were Americans and they had a bright outlook on the world. They thought we can really just fix everything if we just apply scientific administration to the government. And this constitution is kind of in the way, you know, and uh, because it's all these checks and balances, that just messes up everything, right? Because we've got to get ourselves an administration. That's a big word. Uh, in, the, in the constitution reader, you'll see in the progressive section, the word administration is often italicized in their writings. Like, do you love administration? You know? I manage the college administration, I guess, but we don't talk about that much here because I personally hate the term and think that's not even what I do, right? I've got to take care of the business of the college, but the college is a teaching place, and that's what it's supposed to be about. So, but administration is a name to conjure with, with these people, and they even like the term bureaucracy. And so, the, not only does the Constitution have to change, that has to change because the final cause has changed, right? If it's true that change is the only real fact in nature, then the only freedom we could have would be to gain control of the process of change. And so one of the features of that, and this is visible. I mean, if you go to the National Mall, what's it like? Have you ever been there? It's just the greatest place, right? And it was laid out by the founders themselves, three of them. And, a, and an architect, a French architect. And in the hub, the hub of the shape that they design is the capital, the heart of the nation's common political activity. And the states, the big avenues are named for states, and they come out like spokes. So it's a whacking big old wheel. And it won't work unless the hub and the spokes are connected and in their rightful place. And then it's also pure. It's built like Roman architecture or Greek architecture and on purpose, deliberately. And if you just look at the architecture of the individual buildings, first of all, they are beautiful, which is a difference from modern bureaucratic buildings, which are just pug ugly. <laughs> and I even think that's natural that they would be, given what they're for. But if you just look at the Capitol and the White House, they're both dominated by public spaces. Both of them have big entrances. Welcome, you know, big white steps going up to the Capitol, very wide, lots of doors to get in. And when you go in the main door, you're under a massive rotunda. And it invites you to look up and also to mill around and lots of people can be in there. It's a public space. Up at the top, so there's all these statues of the people who made America down through time. But up at the top, there's a fresco on the top. It's very beautiful. I've been up there. And uh, it's a, it, George Washington is sitting up there very high, and other founders around him, and various symbols of the causes of freedom. That's how it's designed. And you know, the, the whole presidential staff worked in the White House 
through the Civil War and beyond, actually Grant's administration, I think, is really built the, what we now call the old executive office building. Uh, the architect said to President Grant at the dedication, and you know it's fireproof, Mr. President. And Ulysses Grant said, pity. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Abraham Lincoln ran his, the presidential office with most of the war two employees, later three. And there were four cabinet offices at the beginning. And there wasn't anything on the National Mall except those things. And it had a poise about it. The Supreme Court was originally in the Capitol. And they all look like places that that kind of government, which is emphatically not administrative in its character, would go on. And of course now it's transformed. And much of it is ugly. There's a place you can stand, say, 300 yards from the Capitol, facing the Capitol on the National Mall, and you get a really great view of the Capitol, east wing of it, I think it is. And then if you look sharply to the right, there is the United States Department of Education in all its glory, right? And if you just look back and forth at the two, which I do from time to time, first time I did it, I nearly fell over when I saw what it meant, right? Because what it looks like, the Department of Education, is like a bureau, like, you know, one of those desks that you can put your papers up in. And, and that's, that function, you couldn't put that function in the Capitol or any of the buildings that are original to the government of the United States. And when I say original, I mean for 100 years. And we say now that that had to be built because the society is so complex. Well, it is terribly complex, isn't it? But wasn't it complex back then? Because think what they did. They built the first free government in history from roots in colonial experience, mainly in some English experience, right? But a different thing in kind, too. And then they defeated the largest nation in history, and then they settled the continent of the United States, the population and gross domestic product of the country growing faster than anything China has achieved in modern times, right? And they didn't even, when they set out on the journey across, they didn't know who, where they were going, right? They'd never, you know, Lewis and Clark is 18, six or seven or eight, somewhere in there. Well, George Washington was calling his army the Continental Army in 1779. He didn't know how big the continent was, right? And they did all of that, and they did it under the same form. And the country became huge and the greatest power on earth. And they solved the problem in those ways. And now we have different ways. And those ways are centralized in their nature. Um, I was, I can't, what meeting, I can't tell, I'm not gonna tell you what meeting I was in today, but I was in a college president's meeting today. I don't go to many of them. I'm very pleased to report to you. Uh, but this particular bunch I like. And we were dealing with some commands from a regulatory body about how to run our colleges in certain respects, right? And the people who sent those, first of all, they can't write to save their lives. But I think they don't want to. I think they can write the way they want to write. Hard to read, technical, convoluted, need an expert to read it. And they're telling us to do things, and everybody sitting in the room is right now running a college with some success, and we're all just shaking our heads. Now, most bodies of college presidents would not be doing that. This is a special breed. But I, I said at one point, you know, shall we sign this thing? Right? You know, it's each, uh, up to each one of us to sign it or not sign it. It's a pledge to do a certain thing that's very politically correct. And it's a personal pledge we're supposed to sign. And I said, well, I'm not going to sign it. And they said, uh, why not? And I said, well, I haven't thought about it very much, but it just isn't the kind of thing I would sign unless I'm made to. And they said, why? And I said, it's the wrong kind of thing. What is that to them? What do they know about it? If it is asking me to try to be fair, well, Lord help us if I couldn't pass that standard, you know, to try to be fair, that'd be pitiful. What they really asked me to do is try to be fair in the ways that they say now, and then under this vague document, we'll say tomorrow and the next day and the day after that and the day after that, right? 
That's the way. Every week now at Hillsdale College, there's some new thing. Did you know there's a federal minimum wage for salaried employees? Do you know that? I found it out in a board report before our board meeting two weeks ago. I was reading, and you know, I hate those things. I, I love the colleagues who write them for me, but there are two of them who write me about stuff like this frequently. And I said to the, to one, to the newer one, not long ago in a staff meeting, I said, you must, be, to the older one, I said, you must be very glad that the newer one's here. And they both laughed out loud, and the, and the newer one said, yeah, a different messenger to shoot. <laughs> it's crazy, right? And it's constant, all the time. I got a thing on a former athletic conference we were in one time where we were berated to go and check right now and do not let the morning pass without checking about the 25% of our young women who were being raped or assaulted. And so the meeting ended and it was 15 to 12 and so I thought I'll do that. I said I'll call Diane Phillip, the Vice President for Student Affairs and I'll say, Diane, I need information please about the 25% of our young women who are being assaulted and raped. And she said, well, Dr. Arn, the number is lower than that. <laughs> and I said, uh, good. I said, uh, what would it be? And she said, well, you know the number. I said, we've had one allegation of rape in my 17 years here. And then she told me something I didn't know at the time. This is a couple of years ago. She said, we haven't caught a young man in the wrong room in the wrong dormitory in the morning for five years. Uh, reduces the opportunity for that kind of thing. But anyway. Are they going to do that? And I said, okay, but the claim is that it's going on all the time and we don't know it. And she's a real smart woman. I said, what about that? She said, well, of course, if we didn't know it, we wouldn't know it. <laughs> I said, but, <laughs> but I said, uh, what do you think? She said, well, we have an RA living on every wing and every floor of every dormitory, and we meet with them every week. And we have a culture here, if the students do something wrong, we're not trying to hurt them and we know that. And you know they're young and stupid, of course they do things that are wrong. But mostly it's amusing when they do. And if they're quick to apologize, we're very quick to forgive. And that means we don't want them afraid to tell us things. Because apart from bad behavior, which is not very common around here, they got all kinds of problems. They're trying to grow up in the modern world and they're trying to deal with this faculty and that is the devil of a problem. <laughs> so you see, it's just, you know, and you know, I can tell you, if somebody assaults somebody around here, if somebody slurs somebody around here, we don't like that. And it doesn't happen very much. And one of the reasons it doesn't is everybody's committed not to do that before they come here. Because you can't live like that if you're going to learn together. What about that spirit? That spirit is unknown to these regulations because the regulations are written about something that can be controlled from a central source. And of course, everything is cookie cutty, cutter and everything is compliance. And the, the crisis of the formal cause, the constitutional crisis is simple. Our government is representative form, the first purely representative form and to control, for a private people, a society to control something as powerful as a government, and make no mistake, our government was built to be and needs to be very powerful. Wasn't easy to beat the King of England. Won't be easy to fight the wars that are going on or looming for us right now. Not easy to protect the persons and property of a great nation. Needs strength. So how are you going to delegate that strength and yet keep it from getting out of hand. And the Constitution of the United States is the greatest answer to that question that's ever been devised. And so the point is, if it breaks down, if the government gets larger than the people, and in economic terms, it is larger than the society, the private society right now, as we speak, if you count the regulatory cost. And here's another thing. What they're doing in all those new ugly buildings in Washington, D.C., is they're making laws. And in addition, they're enforcing those laws in the same agency. And when cases arise under those laws, they're adjudicating those laws. 
And so inside each agency, there is no separation of powers. And that means when you hear from one of them, you should be afraid. Somebody working there has already made a, a decision about you. And who do you appeal to? The poor Congress. You know, how many people hate Congress? You know, if there's 350 million people, 351 million of them hate Congress. <laughs> and they're in a pitiful shape. And the Republican Party, to speak of the Republican Party today, is controlling Congress right now. And what would they have to do to get their grips on this thing? There are two tools available to them since this was set up in a grievous and terrible mistake over 60 years in the past. Because remember, what's happened here is the Congress and President have delegated their authority to these independent agencies who are tenured, the staff members, and who are mostly governed by boards that rotate all the time. And they're sealed off from politics, and to seal them off from politics is to seal them off from us. And so the only way you can fix it is if you can pass a law through both houses of Congress and get the president to sign it. That's the first way. And of course, for the first time in American history, in the last two generations, government is typically divided. And so when one of those things gets in, it's very hard to get it out that, by that means. The second means is the budget. Because it was true, for example, in the Reagan administration, which Charles was talking about today, it was true that the Congress was very tough. And so I had friends who worked in the Reagan administration, and they would have to go testify on Congress, and they feared that experience. And if Congress didn't like what they did, they would pass an appropriation bill that deleted their salary from the agency, and they fired them. Well, we're not doing that anymore, right? We're not passing budgets and appropriation bills anymore. Now we do continuing resolutions, and we can't reach agreement about those things. Now, one of the things the Republican Party is doing today is they're trying to be a lot more serious about passing appropriations bills, and they still haven't got it done. And there's a lot of reasons why they don't. One of them is just the pressure of the vast expenditure and the interests gathered around it are huge. But a second one is, if you pass an appropriations bill, it's a big compromise bill, and there's going to be a whole bunch of ugly stuff in it. And the individual members, their congressional rating, by, if they're liberal, by the liberals, and if they're conservative, by the conservatives, will get hurt. And so they're, they're, they're weak now. And then add to that, everybody like me, I, I, I bet it's true that the faculty of Hillsdale College knows everybody in the country who's an academic who would more or less agree with what I'm saying tonight. And so that means that the overwhelming majority of authoritative opinion is against them. And they're outnumbered. And the current president is extremely good at these politics. And, and look what he's done. I mean, there's a federal, he didn't do it, but there is a federal minimum wage now for salaried employees, the same for every city in the land, I'm told. That means Hillsdale College and Manhattan, same salary, minimum required. So there's that, but you know, think of this immigration thing, because it was just announced that under the prosecutorial power, prosecutorial discussion, discretion, the president would not prosecute anybody here in the country illegally. And that's millions of people. But that means, by the way, that the executive branch by itself is making a determination that will affect ultimately who are the citizens. And in the old days, it was thought the citizens should pick the government. But now it seems to work the other way around. There's no private institution in America, including this one, that is not threatened by this one way or another. But apart from the threats and the dangers and the moat you can build, just, it's just true that the massive energy that is released by letting people govern themselves is the strongest force in human history. Because God made us that way, right? You want to know why the college works the way it does? It works. It's a good college. One of the reasons is everybody here wants to do it. All these little kids, you know, who show up here and leave adults, or as I like to say, almost human beings. <laughs> 
they make a commitment about that before they come, and they're warned, right? And so what we do is we end up with a bunch of people who are foolish, right? They want to, you know, you tell us a whole, you tell, you know, our population is 18-year-old kids who could go to college just about wherever they want. And you tell them, if you come here, you're really going to have to suffer. And they go, yeah, let's do that. I want that, right? You know? <laughs> it's foolish, but it's great. One reason they're not very good is that they're overwhelmed. Another reason they're not very good is that they don't know the things that people used to know, leaders at least, used to know. I just put an argument together. However good a student I am, I will tell you, I've been working on these things for a long time with really great teachers, and I can put that argument together. And what if you can't? Then when you go there, it just looks like things are like this and they've always been like this. I mean, Lord, they're physically entrenched now. 22 million people work for the government, state, local, and federal, great majority local and federal, but they work under general federal directives for the most part. They don't know. Hard to make the distinction. I mean, if you go read Abraham Lincoln, what you'll find out is he put together and could repeat from memory a complete history of the movements of slavery in the nation. Also, what the leading people said about it. Also, the arguments at the heart of it that have to do with the essence of the human being. In other words, when he walked out on the stage in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, he had command. Sublime, profound, awesome to see. Not many like that ever in history, and very few today. And when fundamental things are tending, it's better to know. And so part of it is just bewilderment. They're just bewildered. The early Republican Party, Lincoln says about it, if I can find it. I can't find it, it doesn't matter. So I'll close by saying what I think we should do, what I hope they will do. They are trying harder, many of them in the Congress. And they're frightened. A lot of them are frightened now. It's frightening to me when I see that. They didn't used to be so frightened. It used to be, I could frighten them. Now they're already frightened. Now I try to buck them up when I talk to them. They should uh, become articulate about the meaning of the nation. This idea of equality, that we can engineer people to come out the same, that takes the Gestapo. You're just not going to be able to do that. You been to any classes here at Hillsdale College? Everybody's smart. They don't all make the same grades. It's just they can do different things, right? And some of them can do them awesome well. All of them can do them well. But you can't make them the same. It won't work. They're not made that way. You can force them to seem more the same. And so we should repudiate that understanding of equality. We should think that equality is a natural fact, not a thing to be engineered. The second thing is we should defend the form of the government. We should become articulate about that. We should think that the country is supposed to be governed under a set of rules that limit the government and us. A third thing we should do is we should emphasize citizenship. That's happening right now in politics on a big scale. In other words, the big fact that is relevant to whether you get to participate in the governing of America is whether or not you are a citizen. It's so bad now, by the way, and we move so fast toward international government. And have you noticed, by the way, that uh, these principles that I named of progressivism, they're not specifically American in any way. Our Declaration of Independence is universal, but it, it establishes the universal right to consent of the governed. You make it your own by giving it your consent. There isn't any principle in these progressivism ideas to make it your own. It's everybody's, right? And since it's, it's an expertise that gives title to managing the society toward the future, really experts are sovereign. That's why to mention that somebody's not a citizen is to be accused of racism. Somebody said something about a judge being a Mexican, and everybody took that as a racial comment. Well, maybe it was meant that way, I don't know, but it is just a fact that Mexico is not a race. <laughs> 
it took me a little while to think of that, but I, once I did, I went, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, it, uh, we, should, we should emphasize the fact that this country is for ours, and a great phrase to use is from Winston Churchill. He said one time in the House of Commons, in exasperation, and you know, he was so eloquent, so you could, you could not do worse than copy him, he said, to a labor member, he said, do you not understand that there is no question raised in this house that can be rightly or effectively resolved by expertise. The questions of justice and freedom are the human property. All of us are entitled to them. Nobody knows more about them in principle than anybody else. And if you do more, it's only because you've read and studied and thought more than the next person. And what you've read and studied and thought about is not technical in its nature. And that means finally, that we should repudiate this kind of government. The kind of the thing is what's wrong with it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't adjust it. We shouldn't make it more accountable. It's just a fact that nobody since Ronald Reagan, none of his successors have made that the center of their lives as he did beginning with the time for choosing speech in 1964. And that leads me to my conclusion, which is just two hopeful things. One of them is, if the problem is we haven't tried sufficiently, maybe we could try. Maybe this emergency will produce the effort. And the second one is, this college is thriving, even if threatened, and it's ready to fight. It will go on. Thank you. We now have time for a few questions. Please stand when the microphone is brought to you. She said, if you have a question, hold up your hand. <laughs> Dr. R, you speak a lot about what the good is. In your opinion, what is the good in relation to how a nation should be led? Mm. Uh, okay, that's good. I torture them with the question of the good. Rare chance for you to ask me back. They always try to ask me, well, what do you think it is? And I always say, I don't care what I think it is, what is it? Um, so the good of a thing, according to Aristotle, is the being of a thing, what the thing is, right? So if a thing is destroyed, you know, if the bottle cut the bottom out of it, it's not a bottle anymore, maybe it'll make a funnel. Um, so what is the good of the nation? That's not hard to say, right, because it, it did start, it has a birthday. And the birthday says, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Then it goes on later to say, we always forget this. They say life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence and silly people, including very erudite scholars, have said that uh, by using pursuit of happiness and not happiness, they were saying each person is, is allowed to devise his own happiness. And of course, to some extent that's true, but in the extent that you're gonna act like a horse, or you're gonna be a drug addict, or you're gonna what, you know? The point is that's not gonna make you happy because that's not what it is to be good. Two sentences later, it says that they can throw off the government and establish a new government according to such forms as to them shall be most likely to achieve their, to effect their safety and happiness. Unqualified, right? That's two sentences later. And the purposes of the American government are consent of the governed contributing to safety and happiness. And our freedom is written in the same place. So I think. But I don't think that. I just happen to read it. Um. Uh, uh, there's an argument out there that the Republican Party would have never come into existence had not uh, conditional suffrage in the 1820s expanded into universal male suffrage by the 1850s. And that it was, it was universal male, white male suffrage that, you know, led to the Civil War. 
Um, Dr. Kessler was talking about the fact that there is one party of which we have two parties derived from. And over the years, we've expanded suffrage. And now we have a culture of very small groups of people with very vocal grievances. And we've got political parties catering to those grievances. Is it, this may seem like a dumb question, but is it possible suffrage, we have too much suffrage, and that some form of conditional suffrage may be the salvation of the republic? So, you're not confusing suffrage with suffering. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, uh, first of all, I don't think that's true about that argument about the 1850s. Um, but never mind that. Um, what the founders thought was that suffrage had to be wide enough to represent the great body of the people. Uh, there's no reason in principle, and there is reason to think, that you might uh, limit the suffrage to taxpayers. Winston Churchill proposed something like that in England. He wanted everybody to have a vote, but people who paid taxes to have two, uh, man or woman. He proposed that in the 30s. So there's good constitutional arguments about that, but that doesn't change two facts that are, in my opinion, more important. First of all, the first constitutional check is in America is that they can't do anything unless the people say they can, right? That's the, that's the single most important reason why governments are kept from getting out of control. After that, all the problems come in about us oppressing the minority. Well, the second point would have to be that you would have to have at least a very large majority of people voting. Um, because other than that, some minority could form a closer interest quicker than a majority could, writes Madison in the Tenth Federalist. So you're going to need very wide suffrage. But then I'll add this final point. What I think today is, I say this to friends of mine in Washington these days, my fellow conservative leaders, as I'm styled sometimes. I say, first of all, do you think people like us are going to save America, people who talk for a living and have lots of education? Because we're the problem. I mean, it's true, we're a little rump in that bunch, but there ain't many of us. So what about the fact that the common sense opinions of ordinary people are actually on some really fundamentals. They appear to be much more sound than elites. And I don't think that the driving problems in America today are coming from most people. I actually think that they're coming from highly educated people who went astray 100 years ago and more. Dr. Arden, can you, uh, given that the appropriations process um, fa favors um, uh, control by leadership and omnibus budgets and continuing re resolutions and so forth, um, can you describe a scenario where control of the appropriations could retreat from the continuing resolutions and omnibus budgets to departmental appropriations like you described earlier? Uh, I'm going to try to, re that's Representative Lloyd Hauser who uh, actually is the first car dealer to get a promotion. <laughs> no, uh, to get a demotion by going into politics. Um, so your question is, is it a question about how much control the leadership should have in a legislative body? Just a scenario, how we could get from where we are now. Oh, how do we do it? Yeah. Well, I'm a more disciplined in the caucus fella. Uh, I think the speaker should be strong. And I think that... Uh, I, I, you have to remember that there's almost nothing that, that you can name that would really work today because a complex of things is wrong. So one of the things that's wrong is that the, there are actually a much higher percentage of safe seats in the House than there are in the Senate. And it makes the Senate a very cowardly body. And the House is bolder. 
because not many seats change hands in the House, and that's because of gerrymandering, but it's also because of the effect of the administrative state on politics. Congressmen just get a lot of moxie out of doing stuff for their constituency, getting stuff out of the bureaucracy, which is kind of one of their prime jobs now. So, especially if it were more competitive than it is, then there would be little harm in having very strong speakers, because the effect of that, and leadership, the effect of that would be then, they would actually take a position on the grand things that matter. The budget, the big issues of principle, the scope of the government, those are the big questions that are open today, right? Because, you know, we're in danger, I think, of being overwhelmed by the government. And I don't go to any meetings myself, in, in any kind of meeting, development meeting, around here, running right the college, other college people outside. I don't go to anybody where any meetings where people are not afraid to cross the government. And it's everywhere now. So if there was a party, and, and I, I, I want to say something about our part in founding the Republican Party, which is very noble. You know, the first platform of the Republican Party was the first draft or an early draft that was written in Central Hall by two guys who worked here, right? Very great people. But I also want to remind everybody that before they did that, they were Whigs. And you know, a lot of the early documents and the story of the college you can find in a local publication called the Hillsdale Whig Standard, right? So in other words, we do have a history of forming parties. We also have a history of leaving them. <laughs> so, so I, you know, I, I'm a member of the Republican Party, but I want it to be good, according to that definition right there. And if something comes along that's better, it's very hard to replace a political party. I would like to see it maneuvered into a place where it's got to take a bunch of really strong positions. And so I agree, it should be stronger leadership, probably, if that's what you, you think. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Dr. Arndt, we came here to this Democrat-Republican seminar. My question has been, has been answered in circuitous ways. I would like for one of you to, to capsulize in brief the distinction between Republican political philosophy and Democratic political philosophy. Our candidates don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. That's not on the table. Well, it's... But would you, could you I'll, capsulize for us? I'll take a stab at it. As I do that, I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and just say, I, I left off one of my prime things. We have to undo the politically correct controls on language. You know that thing I said about the Mexican judge? It, I think one of the reasons people believe that guy is because he's prepared to say stuff like that. And uh, I don't even know if he does it artfully or not, but, and it causes outrage, and sometimes I really like it. Um, so what are the two? So first of all, it's a difficult thing to do because um, the parties are not coherent and candid about what they stand for in ways that they had been in the past when they were great. So they give confused, and, and of course everything they say about themselves is designed to attract the voters. And so they don't sit down and write down clear, simple treatises what they believe. A good stab at it would be, what is the difference between democracy and republicanism? Uh, and that difference too is not written in nature, but uh, by old practice, the demos, the deems, are the, means groups of 10, right? In the ranks of the Greek city-states, the nobles would be up front, important people, and then the ordinary folk were in ranks of 10 behind. And ocracy, arche, means rule, a ruling principle. And so the deems rule, that means the many rule. And Aristotle, for one, doesn't think that's a very good form of government. But republicanism, so Madison defines that strictly in the, uh, in the uh, Federalist as all political power is drawn from the great body of the people. And that means 
it's not the same thing as saying everybody decides everything. In other words, to have republicanism, at least in the American sense, and republic, by the way, that just comes from words that means the public things, right? But, so that's a Latin word, old word. Uh, but in America, republicanism means uh, we rule through forms that are, that are designed to grant the power and control it, and control, by the way, even our granting of it. So the way Madison uses the term, it's, it's a symbol for constitutionalism. Because see, if you have a tyranny, one person rules however, whatever he wants, right? You don't necessarily have, a, have to have a constitution, and if you do, it's a fraud. If you're gonna have rule mixed up among a lot of people, you're gonna have to have some big rules, a constitution about how they do that. So I think that in its root in America, as it was used in early practice and more or less consistently since, the Republicans are the people who think that the people should rule but through a constitution. And democracy is a term and was used as a term of aspersion a lot in the founding about the idea that just all the people would vote and meet and, and, and rule because the argument was, and I, I agree with the argument, that will go wrong consistently. Does that help? No. Right. Well, I, 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 I actually spoke tonight about what I think is the driving idea behind the Democratic Party. I'll restate it, I'm happy to. Uh, and I'll try to put, you know, the best face on it I can because it is a kind of a very attractive and magical idea. What if it's true that you could use the tools of science to eliminate all the evils in society? Nobody wants to die of cancer at all. And nobody wants to die today. What if you could make everybody live a really long time and be terribly healthy to the end, right? What if nobody wants somebody to suffer in squalor and poverty because their parents were sick, whereas somebody else is a wastrel all his life and born to wealth and nobility and never does a bit of public uh, uh, serious work? Nobody wants that. That's unjust. That's bad, right? So what if by scientific application of management and other tools, you could eliminate all those terrible things? What if you could do that, right? And the reason we haven't been able to do it, the reason we can do it now, says the founders of the modern Democratic Party. I think it's a fact that this is true. What they said was, we have invented human beings, scholars, others, have invented whole new ways of approaching the problem of governance. It should be neutral, tenured, scientific, and it should proceed by uniform rules. And those rules should apply everybody, and this is Woodrow Wilson talking, so as to marry or wed the interest of the individual with the state so we won't be so fractious and divided anymore. That was their dream, see? And I'll tell you what I think stands directly against that. Uh, it, uh, it's nature. Madison says, we need laws because we're not angels. But we need limits on the laws because the people who govern are also not angels. If it had pleased God to govern us directly, you know, maybe in some nobler way than he governs a dog. Because dogs always act like dogs, right? At least ours do. And Cats always act like cats, and I'll just tell you, I think that's too bad. But, <laughs> but people have discretion over things, right? And because they do, but because they're fallen, and you can understand that in the Christian sense, which is a profound sense, or you can understand it for political purposes, these two things are parallel. You can say that we are fallen because we are necessitous and because we face our own deaths and feel our own pains and enjoy our own pleasures. And so if you're gonna have a, a being like that, you're going to have the problem of granting and controlling the granting of power. And so at the bottom, forget what the argument is between the Democrats and the Republicans, they make lots of arguments. There's an argument between the founding of the United States of America and the thing we have today. 
And I think I've accurately stated its terms. Thank you.